today I, I, will, I will soon leave the, 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 the word to Anna to introduce Jeff, but you know, the, 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 the motivation, uh, the main motivation why I like very much what Jeff is doing uh, is that uh, he has this idea of, uh, uh, you know, uh, using, uh, uh, using a robot to understand brain functions, you know, which is uh, the driving uh, force behind uh, uh, most of my activities uh, since uh, uh, 40, 50 years, <laughs> long time. So, and, and I think that it is uh, very crucial also to the understanding of cognitive architecture. Uh, so, uh, Anna, if you wanted to, yeah. to go ahead and introduce, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, and also welcome to the restart of the ICOG series. We had a bit of a break in March, but the, we had the Transair workshop, which uh, I think that maybe half of you here also were attending. So that's also where I had the, the pleasure of meeting Professor Kritschmer, who is our presenter today. Professor Jeffrey Kritschmer is a professor of the departments of Cognitive Sciences and Computer Sciences at the University of California. Uh, he is a senior member at IEEE and at the Society of Neuroscience. He is the author of over 100 publications and holds seven patents. And uh, his career is a very, very prolific one, both in industry and in academia, in industry where he's had a 15 years experience in software engineering, if I understood well for companies also like IBM and um, Raytheon. Whereas his academic career is now counting nearly 20 years of experience in designing adaptive algorithms in creating neurobiologically plausible network simulations, which is a mouthful and I'm really tired <laughs> of not garbling my speech over it. And as well as constructing brain-based robots, which is precisely the topic of um, his talk today. So robots whose behavior is guided by neurobiologically inspired models. So with that, I will definitely spotlight Jeffrey here. And I would like to welcome you to the talk, Neurobotics Connecting the Brain, Body and Environment. Go ahead, thank Jeff. All right, thank you, Anna. And thank you, uh, Julio, for inviting me and uh, giving me a chance to meet all of you. Um, let's get set up here. Perfect. Okay. Um, and some of you saw a shorter version of this talk if you went to the Transair workshop. So uh, I'm gonna follow the same idea, but uh, expand on a few things, give a few more examples. Um, and, my area of interest is called neurorobotics, which is very similar to what you guys are doing. Um, and we have a book that's, I'm hoping that comes out this summer uh, with a former student of mine, Tiffany Hu, uh, who's at HRL Laboratories. It's called Neurorobotics Connecting the Brain, Body and Environment. And uh, uh, we, we've, in, in the book, we build to uh, some design principles of what to think about when designing a neurorobot. And, um, our lab is called the Cognitive Anteater Robotics Laboratory. Uh, in the United States, we have mascots. <laughs> um, so the mascot for the University of California, Irvine, uh, is the anteater. It's a long story. I can tell you later why, because there really are no anteaters in California. But that made a nice acronym. So uh, if I mention a robot named Carl, most of our robots are called Carl something. <laughs> okay, so let's... Uh, Let's get into it. Um, let me just talk about the neurobotics approach. It might be slightly different than what you're used to. Um, it's, it's a holistic approach that you wanna not only look at the brain and, and what's happening in the nervous system, but look at how that affects behavior and how the body affects behavior. Uh, so it forces you to consider how behavior in the environment affects the design of the, the agent. Uh, you have to have actions in the environment. Uh, and then since you're using real physical robots, there, there's limits of uh, the input and output, uh, the sensory input. I mean, it's noisy. Uh, you can't bias things. You can't have an act of, you know, the eye of God uh, sending information. So you have to do local sensing like a real organism. Um, and this reduces biases. So uh, the real world is complex, it's dynamic. Uh, it doesn't come with rules. Uh, and so in some ways it's easier because then you don't have to build the complexity of a virtual environment. Uh, and this becomes a more rigorous and realistic test of algorithms. 
And I should say before I get too far into the talk, feel free to interrupt, interrupt me or, or make this interactive if you like. I'm not sure how you usually do it, but if you have questions, uh, feel free. I'll, I'll keep checking chat every so, so often make sure there's things yeah usually we keep the participants muted just so that we don't have any background noise but uh, the chat is um, available and uh, if we have any questions i will uh, let you know so i'm monitoring it as well okay perfect um so for my work especially there, there's two reasons i do this uh, the main reason i got into this is is i wanted to understand how the brain works uh, and so this made a, a powerful tool to uh, test brain theories. Uh, you know, when, once you have the model, you have every access to every aspect of this artificial brain. Uh, so you can analyze and perturb the, the uh, nervous, the artificial nervous system in ways that a, a, a real neuroscientist, a, a wet neuroscientist can't with the recording technology, because either you can only record from a handful of neurons, uh, barely record from the connections, or use other methods that have a very uh, low resolution, uh, spatial or temporal re resolution. And then if you set up your robot, you can mimic some of the lab experiments uh, that they do with animals or, or humans. Uh, and so you can test this in more natural conditions uh, and see how uh, you know, your artificial brain might respond to real world situations that could go beyond what they do in the lab. And the flip side of this is, since we have uh, a working model for intelligent systems, the, uh, the, the nervous system, uh, this might actually be a way to advance artificial intelligence. Because I think uh, a lot of us in the AI and machine learning field realize that there's been great progress, but we're, we're still falling short of, of what we would call true uh, biological intelligence. So let me... Uh, do a little, I guess, memory or history. Uh, this is probably, this is my first uh, work in, um, in the neurorobotics field. Uh, I was a postdoc with uh, Gerald Edelman at the Neurosciences Institute in San Diego, California. Uh, and he didn't like the word robot. So he called all these things brain-based devices. Um, but it's worth, I think, going through this because this is kind of the, the way we still, uh, do these neurorobotic experiments. So we, we start with some sort of robotic device uh, that has, whoops, that has uh, sensing. So it has cameras, it has microphones or ears. Uh, it can pick up objects uh, and it has uh, a way of sampling. Uh, we called it the taste of objects uh, with its fingertips. Uh, and so the taste is the conduct conductivity of metal. But, um, each of these boxes, and this is why I wanted to show this, because this is typical of, of one of our experiments, is a, is a neural network. So each of these boxes is groups of neurons, and each of these uh, arrows are projections, connections between neurons, and they represent probability distributions. So uh, what you have is, is you know, thousands of neurons and, and many thousands of synaptic connections, many of them plastic. And we try and follow, unlike, uh, unlike you know, deep, learn, deep neural networks, uh, we try and follow the anatomy. So there's auditory streams, there's visual streams, the information gets into different feature detectors for short segments, uh, and the receptive fields expand to the point where an area like this, which is mimicked after inferotemporal temporal cortex, uh, can see the whole scene and starts to do object recognition. And then there's typically in, in our models, there's some sort of value system that, uh, that has this neuromodulatory effect. So that when something is salient in the environment, it, it modulates the learning and increases the learning. So just to give you an idea of what one of these looked like, here's the robot uh, early on when it's just learning, it just runs around, picks up blocks. This is a early visual system, so you get a, a uh, nice retinotopic map and each pixel is a neuron in its brain, the brighter the pixel more active. And this is the uh, inferal temporal cortex that's doing the object recognition. And then these are motor areas. And if it's active on the left, I think it's uh, bad tasting or, or aversive. And then there's activity on the right, it's good tasting or repetitive. 
So this is the first time it's seen a block. The vertical block is good tasting. It's starting to learn and build up a perceptual category for vertical block. And this is the first time it sees the spotted block. Spotted block is bad tasting because it's weakly conductive. So it's trying, it should remember that after so many pairings to uh, avoid, the, avoid the bad block and go to the good block. And this is after about, you know, 10 pairings, similar to what would happen in operant conditioning. And before I run the video, there's the block. It's oriented about at 45 degrees, but there's a strong enough pattern, perceptual category in this imperial temporal cortex in its brain to drive neurons uh, that would predict that this is good tasting. So not only has it made this predictive link in association, but it's also recognizing things uh, uh, invariantly. So it recognizes things, whether uh, position invariance, uh, orientation invariance, and, and somewhat uh, size invariance. Uh, and it's because it sees the world as continuous stream of information. And so this is good tasting, so it still picks it up. And this is the bad tasting block where it still looks at it, but it won't pick it up because it's now associated with something that's aversive and it backs away. So anyway, besides the nice trip down memory lane for me, uh, it's a, it demonstrates you know, a typical neurobotics experiment where we design uh, a neural network based on what we know uh, at the time uh, of what's going on in the brain. Uh, we design an experiment that fits similar to, so we can compare it to animal experiments, in this case, conditioning. And then we're able to analyze after the, all the, from the complete history of all the learning until after the experiment's done, uh, all the activity and, and, uh, and that was in its artificial brain during learning and after learning. So I think it makes a very powerful tool. Oops, and so now I'm gonna expand on this and go into some of the ideas that, you know, that was 2002, which is kind of scary. So over 20 years of doing this, uh, come up with, you know, design principles that, that we think should go into, uh, into a neuro robotic system. And like I said, before I got started the talk, uh, I was very inspired by uh, Rolf Pfeiffer and Josh Bongard's book, How the Body Shapes the Way We Think. Uh, and, uh, for a number of years, I, I taught a class in cognitive robotics, and this was the textbook that we used. Uh, and they emphasize embodied physical agents. But uh, I'm, I teach in the cognitive science department, and I'm very much interested in ner the nervous system. Uh, and so to some degree, their, their book neglects, uh, especially hardcore neuroscience, like getting down to the neurons. Uh, they, they really uh, have a beautiful take on and really push the idea of physical embodiments and critical for intelligence, which I totally agree. But I did wanna revisit this from maybe a neuroscientist point of view. So coming up with some neurorobotic design principles, kind of building on what they did, uh, there is sort of a, a large part, the majority of the nervous system that deals with just the here and now, like responding quickly uh, to things and reacting. Um, and it builds up very interesting behavior. And sometimes there's some short-term plasticity. Now the brain is a learning machine. And so there's adaptive behavior that happens over a lifetime. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, parts of the brain and, and things within the brain that are doing learning and memory at, at various scales. And then when we actually start looking at the work we've done, work other people have done, uh, there are all these trade-offs that really make uh, interesting behavior and, and also uh, deal with the motivations because motivation is very important for behavior. Uh, so there's all these opposing motivations depending on your, your needs. And, and that really leads to interesting behavior. 
Uh, and what I always found, what I found interesting, because it's a, a, a one of the areas of research, uh, specific research in our lab is, is neuromodulation. So there's these subcortical modulators and hormones that really are regulating these trade-offs uh, at a very low level. So let's look at the first principles, which have to do with embodiment uh, and reactions uh, and efficiency. So this is some work that we did. Uh, we had to compete in RoboCup with a Segway robot, and we had to catch a, a fast moving soccer ball it was a really hard task to actually do this in computer vision and a neural network. So after much head scratching, we just came up with uh, this plastic hoop, like a hula hoop. We, we looked at a bunch of materials and something that was compliant, that was at the right level, that the robot could trap and then uh, feel it with, with uh, touch sensors or, or IR sensors around it, gave it time to actually catch the ball and then put it in a, a gripper that it could kick it. And this is an example, and this is a, a very nice concept from Rolf Pfeiffer of morphological computation. So the, it's offloading what would be brain processing on something physical, something morphological. And it's amazing how energy efficient biology is. So if you look at, uh, bipedal robots, uh, and, and a lot of them follow this kind of idea like Asimo from Honda, uh, and they take a lot of energy and it looks very jerky. Uh, if you actually look at the human body, it's also doing this idea of morphological computation. So it's pushing off and then letting gravity do the work of falling down. And, and in your knees and joints are hinged so that your, your leg will naturally fall forward. So you don't have to think about it. You don't have to do brain processing. The body is actually doing that work. And lo and behold, it takes a lot less energy uh, to do that. And if you look at the brain, there are all these tricks that the brain is doing to use very, uh, very little energy. Um, 20 watts is what they say compared to you know, kilowatts that a computer is doing. And what it does is it reduces redundancy. It does uh, a lot of sparse coding. It does this pick, this B is sort of, it adapts. So whatever the uh, distribution of stimuli that you have to uh, respond to, it naturally adapts very quickly to, uh, to that range. Uh, and so that means less neurons are needed to uh, encode something. And there's, there's just a wide range of, of properties that the brain's doing so that it can uh, be very efficient. And so that's called efficiency through cheap design. And also in this sort of first, you know, reactive thing is sensory motor integration. So on the right was this really nice experiment from a number of years ago, uh, showing that, you know, uh, this is a figure ground segregation problem. So this object on the table is very hard for computer vision to see. And what, but it, the problem becomes very easy if you actually, integrate what you're sensing with what your movement is. So this robot arm that's kind of flailing, once it hits this object, it suddenly pops out because it moves. And also you feel it. Uh, and you have this expectation as you're moving your arm, uh, maybe you know it's in the dark that you wouldn't expect to see, feel something, you feel it, and then you get this uh, violation of expectations plus this pop out because something started moving. And then that makes the problem extremely easy. You're, motor action cause sensory stimulation. And so this is the idea between sensory motor integration. And if we, I, I also teach a course in a systems neuroscience and all the textbooks and the one I use, uh, you'll have separate uh, chapters and sections on the sensory system. And then they break down the sensory system to different components. And the same with the motor system is a whole nother set of uh, section of the book, but the brain really doesn't work like that. And this is a nice review by uh, Joaquin Fuster. And after you get past you know, the primary sensory and primary motor, there's all this shared information to the point where uh, a few hops in the brain, uh, there's, there's this blurring between sensory and motor. I mean, it's multimodal and uh, neurons are responding to both. 
Uh, and so I think that's really the way the brain works. And it's too bad we have to teach uh, neuroscience that way, but it is a complicated topic. But keep in mind, even when you're taking one of these neuroscience courses that uh, we really shouldn't think of them as separate systems. It is one system trying to solve problems. And there's another concept in this kind of uh, first level of principles that are kind of the reaction kind of principles. And this is degeneracy. Uh, instead of redundancy, I like the word degeneracy because that means that different elements can perform the same function or, or make the same output. Uh, and as opposed to redundancy where you have a, a identical copy. And degeneracy seems to be the rule in, uh, in biological systems. And this is um, a nice paper by Gerald Edelman and Joe Galley um, that just listed, they have this table, this is only a part of the table, of all the different parts of areas of biology that, that have degeneracy from the genetic code where you would have uh, possibly 64 different combinations of, uh, of nucleotides, but you only have 18 amino acids. Every triplet makes amino acids. That's a degenerate code all the way down to, uh, you know, all the way up to communication where there are just a large, almost infinite number of ways that we can communicate with each other. Um, and you just see this throughout uh, biology. So it's important to take this in consideration when you're uh, designing a robot or, or look for it. Uh, even if you don't design it, look for it when you uh, look at what your robot's doing. And this is some work we did. We made a very detailed model of the hippocampus and you know, down to all the different areas that feed into the hippocampus and then the subfields of you know, dentate gyrus, CA3 and CA1 and entorhinal cortex. And it's doing a dry version of the Morris water maze. And if you can see in the upper or towards the right of the screen, there's this platform that it can't see, but it can feel with a, a downward pointing uh, light sensor. And after about the same amount of time it would take for a, a rat to solve the Morris water maze, uh, it shows goal-directed behavior. In this case, it bounces off a blue wall and then finds the platform. And every time you run this, you just like with a rat, you start it from a different starting location. And again, it goes towards the platform and then towards the blue wall instead. And this is an effective strategy. It gets right to the platform. And, and I say no two neuro, neuro robots are alike because I've done these experiments over many years and you run this multiple times. Maybe you slightly vary the probability, you know, the probability distribution of, of, the, of the artificial brain, but you don't even have to do that. There's enough noise and difference in the world that the no two experiences are like. And if you have plasticity, you get different, um, different outcomes. That's degeneracy. And so in this case, we ran this nine different runs, uh, you know, complete trials. And some went to the blue wall, some went to the red wall, some went directly to the platform. So based on experience and what worked in the past, uh, it would build up its own uh, strategy. And you see this in the, after, after learning and testing. So one of the tests you do for this uh, task is you remove the platform and then you just see where it explores. And so one uh, robot subject spent about 50% of the time in the quadrant where it thought the platform would be and then gave up and then started searching around. Uh, another one was very perseverating and spent like 85% just searching and searching and searching here, uh, never giving up. Uh, so you see that at the behavioral level, and then we looked at the neural level, and we looked at place cells in the CA1 of the, this artificial brain. And so the, a place cell, if you don't know, is kind of like a, the brain's GPS system. It'll fire when the animal is in a particular location. So we saw place cells emerge in this model. And when our robot went through the same location, uh, with the same heading, so the same direction through the same location, the same place cell fired, but all of the neurons that led to that firing changed every trial. So after you know one or two 
steps back. So this is kind of working back to these neurons cause this to fire, these neurons cause those neurons to fire, et cetera. After a few steps back, it was a totally different set of neurons firing that led to the same place cell firing. That's degeneracy at the neural level. And then um, very important for this kind of reactive system is something that you know you guys as computer programmers probably do is, is multi-threading, multitasking, and event-driven processing. Well, the brain is the ultimate, the nervous system is the ultimate uh, event-driven system. And um, we, we are multitaskers, so we do things in parallel and we get information, sensory information, we have to respond to that. So we have almost like this interrupt uh, to respond to it. And so uh, we should build this into our architectures. Uh, you know, this is an old idea for robot architectures, it goes back to Rodney Brooks and subsumption architecture. And this nice uh, paper by uh, Tony Prescott's group looked at the subsumption architecture and looked at the uh, mechanisms of defense in the rodent and, and showed that you could have this layered uh, subsumption architecture to explain uh, the nervous system for, for uh, responding to defense, where uh, a noxious stimuli would cause a reflex. Uh, sudden uh, stimuli off in the distance would cause the startle response. Things that are complex might go through and have context, might go through hippocampus or even frontal cortex and down here. Each of these sensory things are an event and each of these are responses, the appropriate responses to the events. And so it's a nice way of actually thinking about how the brain is organized. And, and it has this kind of not only layered structure, but it has this event-driven kind of structure. It's not a sense, think, and act kind of serial structure. And that's, this is, if you ever read Pfeiffer and Bongard's book, they, uh, they uh, use a lot of manga um, illustrations to, to, uh, to emphasize their point. So this, they said, was the old way of doing AI, sense, think, and act. And this is what I said is the neurobotics way of multitasking and responding to events. And um, building on Tony Prescott's work, they, they built also a very event-driven system based on the basal ganglia. And so this is typical behavior in the rat and then a robot where initially when it's, uh, when it's in an unfamiliar environment, it hugs the walls because it's safer. And eventually, once it becomes uh, more comfortable, it actually will do foraging and exploring in the middle of the arena. And so they mimic this by building uh, an event-driven system based on the basal ganglia. So the basal ganglia has kind of these stripes between the cortex and different parts of the basal ganglia that respond to different events and then select which is the appropriate action given some sort of sensory stimuli or some motivation. Uh, by the uh, by, the animal. Okay, so let's go to the next sort of set of design principles, building up from kind of the here and now and reaction. Uh, how do we build things over over a long period of time, and that leads to adaptive behavior. And very important to this is value. Uh, and when I say value, it's, you know, good, bad, or reward punishing, but also can be anything that's maybe interesting. And uh, this, I got interested in like around 2008, if you see this review paper I wrote back then, and uh, I thought it would just be a few year project, and I'm still thinking about it because it's, there's so much to it. Um, one of the things that fascinated me was you have all of these different neuromodulatory systems like the cholinergic system, dopaminergic system, uh, noradrenergic system, serotonergic system. And they're all located down here, uh, subcortical, uh, in the midbrain or the brainstem. That's where these chemicals, the sources of these chemicals. And then you see these colored projections, they go all over uh, the nervous system, very strong to uh, the cortex. And then also there's uh, signals going down a stream that aren't shown here that, that go to the rest of the nervous system. <clears throat> and if you look at them, there's, there's a lot of similarities that when they're on, you know, when they're tonically active, so they're, they're not silent, they're active, the, the organism is engaged 
but it's very exploratory. It's, it's behavior gets a little bit arbitrary. And then when there's some event, like uh, there's some risk or cost or reward, even like a surprise or just a noisy situation where you need to ramp up your attention, uh, you get this phasic response, a very quick response uh, that causes you to be decisive and exploitive and cause the network to be a, a winner take all network. And so um, you have this interesting exploration exploitation trade off that, that's generated by these systems. And this is work we did to look at this. Um, this is the original call when we first got to Irvine. And these are, this is its brain. And this is the serotonergic system. It's this, uh, this red panel, it's learned is something that might be a negative. This green panel is something that it learned is, is rewarding. And so you see this was a very quick phasic reaction of its dopaminergic system. Um, and that caused a very strong attentional effect to the green object and to the, an orienting response. And when there's something that's not salient, it's still engaged in a task. So when, once this panel turns something that's not salient like that magenta color, you see that the whole brain is tonically active and it's exploring, but uh, it, it's, its movement is kind of random and arbitrary. So let me just start this over once again, real quick. And see how rapid, once it sees a flick to red, you see a rapid phasic response for serotonin and a very rapid uh, winner take all response to red and uh, avoid. And then again, rapid response to rewarding system and attention to the green object. And this value can be taken to another level where it gets into a prediction. So uh, June Tani's group has, has looked at this over a number of years building up uh, recurrent neural nets and doing predictive behavior and being able to predict uh, gestures and things like that. And then one, one thing about value in, in all these systems um, that, that is a limitation is the value is artificial. We, we kind of send the value signal in, but it really doesn't have meaning. Uh, and I like this work by uh, Jeff Kloon and, and JB Moray, uh, which looks at value from a sense of real damage to a robot. And the robot does some mental simulation so that it has goes through possible different gates that might overcome this. So first it thinks about this in this behavior map and does a mental experiment. And then when something seems promising, uh, it'll try that out on the real robot. Uh, and very quickly through this kind of mental simulation, it's able to adapt and recover from what I would call real value damage. So I think this is a step, this kind of idea is a step towards uh, having real value in, in your system and responding to real value in, in, in a way that, um, that adapts its behavior. Okay. Now that's still adapting on a short term, what about very long term? Uh, and there's an old idea that you have rapid learning in the hippocampus, and then you have over time consolidation of that learning, and it gets awful loaded or consolidated in the, in the neocortex. And this is called the complementary learning systems. And this was, uh, this was originally proposed by Jay McClellan, uh, Bruce McNaughton and Randy O'Reilly and still has a lot of evidence supporting it. But one piece of evidence that kind of challenged this was by uh, Richard Morris's group uh, and, uh, and George Say did a series of experiments where if, and I, I won't go through this experiment, but I'll kind of explain if you had, if you had a layout like this, which they called a schema, if you put something new in this, but it still fit within this context or schema, you didn't have to have this long consolidation to the, the cortex. It would very rapidly get into the cortex. Uh, and so that kind of challenged that complementary learning systems idea. 
that you could still have rapid consolidation of long-term memories if it fit within a context or a schema. And um, this was proposed also by uh, Van Kesteren and colleagues in a model called schema-linked interactions between medial prefrontal and medial temporal regions, or SLIM. And the idea is if something is congruent, so you had this rubber duck that goes with the bathtub, and then you see a new duck, and that actually fits within the duck schema, then it very quickly gets consolidated in prefrontal cortex, and prefrontal cortex turns off the hippocampus during this time so that it doesn't have interference and this information can get pulled into uh, this existing schema. Um, but if you have this duck and you have a new situation that's incongruent, then you do need the hippocampus to actually uh, rapidly learn this association. And then over time, it'll get uh, consolidated in the, in the, uh, the cortex. So Tiffany Hu, uh, wanted to look at this idea and built a, a very detailed neural net of the prefrontal cortex and the different areas of the hippocampus and, uh, and uh, association cortex, and also had neuromodulators for familiar and novel, uh, novel situations. And so the idea is you type in that uh, GUI, an object, in this case, uh, teddy bear, and it's looking for the teddy bear, but it's also learning about this room, this classroom, and everything that goes in that room and the layout. And it takes a while, finds a teddy bear, but it's also done a bunch of learning of that schema. And then a few trials later, it knows exactly where the teddy bear is. But then I can cue it, I can put it in another uh, room. So now it has to learn a new schema. So it's trying to recover a cup. And so it realizes this is an incongruent system, uh, incongruent situation. So it builds a whole new schema uh, for this. And then it very quickly is able to find the cup after a while. It's still able to recover things from the original schema because now it's actually put these two different contexts in two different kind of uh, memories. And also if you queue with something new, like a banana, it knows that a banana should fit within the schema that goes with uh, the break room table where we usually put food in our lab. And so then it very quickly can pick up an object it's never seen, be it's never had to pick up before. And this is just the, the results where the amount of time it takes to, over time to retrieve objects, um, goes down and the uh, correct picking up of objects um, increases, the, the performance increases, and then you can give it a new object that fits within that schema and it can very rapidly find it. And then you can put it into a new room and it has the same profile, put it back into the original schema. It has not forgotten that. It's, over, it's, it's overcoming catastrophic forgetting. And if you queue it with something, that it hasn't had to pick up before, like a book. It knows that books fit within the context of a classroom. And this is where the most likely places you find a book. Or if you queue it with a food object like a banana, it knows that this is the most likely place that you would find food is on the table in a break room. So it very nicely solves a bunch of machine learning AI problems. It overcomes catastrophic forgetting. Uh, it shows in a in a sense, lifelong learning, because uh, it's able to learn over a long time. Uh, and it's able to switch tasks depending on what the uh, context is. And so I think these ideas of how memory works in the brain actually can help uh, AI and machine learning. And then this robot uh, is from Toyota, the human support robot. So uh, we were actually tasked to use this robot to look at cognitive ideas that could help uh, support people. So context would be very important for a task and knowing what the appropriate thing to do given a context or a schema. Uh, and so if the robot's aware of this, then it can act appropriately. All right, last set of principles gets to the behavioral trade-offs. So, you know, life is full of compromises <laughs> and, and contradictions. 
uh, and our changing needs and motivations uh, might tip the balance of which way we have to do these trade-offs. Uh, and if you implement them, you actually get really interesting behavior. Uh, if you actually set up the situation, even the environment that would cause a trade-off, you get interesting behavior. And uh, the Oscars were last night. So conflict always makes a good story. I think every movie <laughs> that's, one, that's been up for an Oscar had some sort of conflict. So what are these conflicts? Well, the, you know, an easy one is reward versus punishment. Uh, more complex ones are the uncertainty in the world. You have expectations of how much noise there is in the world, but then you get surprises. There's exploration sometimes versus exploitation, which we talked about. Uh, there's just, do I go and forage food or do I have to defend myself or defend my, my home? Uh, that's an important trade-off. Um, also, you know, do I do I actually get social, you know, do social engagement or do I do things on, on, you know, on my own? And there's the reasons to do both. And, uh, and then also, you know, how, uh, you know, if, if there's a situation, sometimes it's actually useful to actually increase my stress level so I can deal with that situation rapidly. And what I find really interesting is the chemicals in our brain that regulate these trade-offs are subcortical, uh, very low level, some of these we've talked about are neuromodulators. Some of these are hormones like orexin or oxytocin. Uh, some of these are, are stress hormones like glucocorticoids. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the things we take for cognitive behavior are really happening at a very low level in the brain. And let's just look at a, a few of these. So um, you have reward versus punishment, but you also have within the same system invigorated versus withdrawn. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at the dopaminergic and serotonergic system, so uh, 5-HT is the chemical name for serotonin. Uh, you know, if, if you look along this axis, if you have, you know, dopamine's thought to be a related to a reward prediction error. So it's expected reward. And serotonin is sometimes thought of as harm aversion. So that goes with punishment. So you have this trade-off between reward and punishment. But also with dopamine, the more, dopamine in the system, the more active you are, invigorated. And the more serotonin there is, there's evidence that you're more inhibited in your behavior or withdrawn. And so I find it interesting that this is uh, from Peter, Diane, and Bourreau, uh, this idea that you can have this kind of a <clears throat> Cartesian matrix of, of what happens between uh, when you have different levels of these. Uh, and so it actually has two behavioral trade-offs uh, within these two uh, neuromodulatory systems. So I wanted to model this trade-off <clears throat> and came up with a very simple, uh, simple neural network where with this Roomba, uh, there was several sensory events, could be an object, uh, could be a light flashes, could be a bumps into something. There was an attentional filter that, um, only objects that were unexpected, uh, only events that were unexpected actually led to uh, a gating of information. And then the dopamine system regulated uh, invigorated activities like moving in the middle of the room or exploring an object and the serotonin system regulated more withdrawn behaviors like follow the wall, uh, find the, the nest. And you'll notice that these frontal cortex areas project back to the neuromodulatory areas with this circle, which is an inhibition. So these systems are important for coping. So after you deal with the stressor or the event, then the frontal cortex will send signals to turn off the, the neuromodulators because that event has been taken care of. So let's look at the behavior. So this Roomba is, now in an unfamiliar environment, just like the, the mouse or the rat, so it'll hug the walls. It's heading towards the charging station, that's its nest. But now it's, at some point it gets comfortable or familiar, the dopamine system takes over and it starts exploring the middle of the room and looking for novel objects. And so very briefly, this is the, um, 
this is the neural activity, just a trace of, of one trial. So it's 120, uh, it's actually 240 seconds or, or uh, four minutes long. And these are the different uh, actions it's taken. It starts out you know, in an unfamiliar environment. So it's sticking to the walls or trying to find its nest. And then at some point, uh, the dopamine system becomes active and it starts exploring objects. But right here in the very middle of the trial, uh, the, the trial goes on in the complete darkness. We flash the lights on and so you get this light event. And then you see a very uh, a strong phasic response of serotonin, which causes it to uh, be anxious and withdrawn, and then it goes back to finding the nest. So eventually, after a period of time, the dopamine system gets a little bit uh, higher, the serotonin system is calmed down, uh, and then and then starts exploring again. All right, that's typical behavior. And this is typical behavior of uh, a whole bunch of runs right after the light flash. So the light flash is at time zero, and you see anxious behavior, wall following, uh, going to the charging station. And then about a minute into after the light flash, then you see curious behavior which starts exploring the middle of the room. That's typical. What happens if we do an artificial lesion of the um, medial prefrontal cortex? This is the prefrontal cortex area that has a strong inhibitory effect on uh, the serotonin system. Well, when you get a, a stressor like that light flash, it never recovers. It stays in an anxious state. Um, and this could be a, a model for anxiety. Uh, and you could also think of it as a model for depression because uh, when you are in a constant state of stress or anxiety, you actually become withdrawn. So you kind of go into hiding and that's what our little robot did. Uh, if we lesion the orbital frontal cortex, which has a strong influence on the dopaminergic system, uh, then there's too much dopamine in the system and it's overactive. It's almost like it, the robot's on cocaine and it has an obsessive compulsive disorder. So it doesn't have, uh, it, it takes risks that are, that are unnecessary and is always curious and always exploring. So it shows really nicely these trade-offs. And kind of bring a lot of this home. Let's just look at this one last experiment. Um, and look at all the design principles and see which design principles it followed and which ones it didn't. So starting with the action reaction design principles. Um, so this was an embodied system. It was on a physical robot. We didn't do too much mor morphological computation with it, but we used the, uh, the Roomba uh, from iRobot and the Roomba sh shape is, is a nice uh, example of morphological comp uh, computation. Uh, you know, the, the Roomba shape that's circular works very well with walls and corners and never gets stuck. One of the reasons why it was so popular as a commercial uh, vacuum cleaner. Uh, we didn't put in our model any efficiency and cheap design, but I think the Roomba itself is a nice example of, of cheap design. It's a very simple design and clean, and that leads to uh, making the movement of it much easier. Uh, sensory motor integration. There was a nice close coupling of the sensory information. There was a, a LIDAR on the robot. Uh, um, there was a bump sensor, uh, light level uh, that was closely tied to motor activity. This is a very much an event-driven system. Um, and it was degenerate. So different events led to the same anxious or curious behavior. And also uh, there was a split for the degeneracy. Uh, the same event led to different behavior. So a bump if it was anxious, a bump would be, oh, that's something I got, I got to hide from. Or if it was more curious, a bump would be something like, oh, that's something I got to investigate. So it's degeneracy in a different direction. It was certainly multitask and event driven. I had multiple actions. Events drove uh, the neuromodulatory levels in the system and that biased the behavior. And it wasn't a very it really didn't deal too much with long-term memory, but it did have short-term plasticity. Uh, the the uh, cholinergic noradrenergic system showed habituation. So if it cut, got a bump the first time, it had a very strong response and then short-term plasticity habituated to that. So then the subsequent bumps didn't have as, as much a response. And we had sensitization. So short-term plasticity in the 
serotonergic and dopaminergic system. So every time it got another signal from the, that system, it would actually build on that and facilitate. But there was no long-term memory in there. There certainly was value. Uh, the sensory stimuli was very closely tied to value, which uh, was tied to its curious or anxious behavior and was tied to this neuromodulatory system. But it didn't address sort of more a predictive system. It was much more of a reactive system. And then trade-offs, uh, it was really designed to explore some trade-offs. So uh, it didn't look at reward versus punishment, but it did directly look at uh, invigorated versus withdrawn trade-offs. Uh, and, and looked at this idea of a behavioral opponency between the serotonergic and dopaminergic system. Um, and it also addressed exploration versus exploitation. So the phasic and tonic neuromodulation had different influences on whether it would make a decision, a rapid decision, or just kind of uh, ra randomly choose between different behaviors. Um, didn't really defend its territory didn't have a stress or calm. I suppose it could say social versus solitary. So when it's investigating novel objects, it was sociable. Uh, when it was hiding by its nest or charging station, it was solitary. Anyway, I think this is nice to actually follow these design principles and see how many of these you can actually, uh, actually check off that, that your uh, system did. So I think, <laughs> You know, over many years of working on these systems in, in neural robotics, uh, maybe for artificial general intelligence, you should follow as many of these principles be, as possible. You certainly should have a reactive system that, that's uh, reflexive, has short-term plasticity, that's very responsive, and that builds up behavioral repertoires. And then you do need some sort of long-term learning and memory to get artificial intelligence, uh, artificial general intelligence. Uh, so that means you need a predictive system. You need to overcome some of the limitations of, uh, of current machine learning that it has to learn over a lifetime. It has to be able to generalize, but it also has to be able to uh, be able to transfer information and also not forget what it's learned previously. And I think uh, interesting behavior comes through these trade-offs that uh, opposing environmental needs. So having motivation in the system and more complex needs than just one need uh, leads to interesting behavior. And I think from a neuroscience standpoint, I think we really need to look strongly uh, at these neuromodulatory and hormone, hormonal systems uh, too much too much attention is paid on, uh, on the cortical systems, whereas these low-level systems are doing a lot of uh, heavy lifting for what, what the brain is doing and, and what's leading to cognitive behavior. And sort of in general, I think neurobotics and broadly cognitive robotics uh, has a lot of applications, a lot of societal benefits in the future. Certainly human assistance having a more natural interaction with people uh, and support systems. Uh, autonomous driving, there's a lot of edge cases and open issues in autonomous driving that, um, <clears throat> that we do, that we do as cognitive beings, that, that, uh, that we take cues that are not in these systems. So I think that would help. Uh, medical systems, certainly assistive uh, medicine, uh, also doing some of the, uh, the work, especially these days, uh, robots have been uh, proposed to like, you know, help in areas that, that might be infected. Um, I think a lot of the hippocampal navigation work could really have a lot of applications to search and rescue, uh, and certainly manufacturing, having more intelligence on the, on the manufacturing line would be another area for neurorobotics and cognitive robotics. And, um, this is the team during pandemic. There's a lot more people, but uh, we haven't been, we usually have a nice picture every year of, of the total lab with all our robots, but uh, this is what it's been like usually. <laughs> Those things are opening up for us, so we're starting to get back in the lab. Uh, and then uh, I talked a lot about Tiffany Hu, uh, who did, uh, is my, my co-author on the book and did the, uh, the schema work. And then uh, Harak Kashiap worked with her on the, the Toyota robot. Uh, Shin Yin, I didn't have a chance to talk about her robotics work, but she's done a lot of really interesting work in terrain classification, neuromorphic engineering for robots, and, and also uh, attention systems. 
and these are our funding agencies. And if you want more information, here's a couple links here. And last slide. Uh, so the future outlook, uh, I think neurobotics is a really powerful tool uh, for studying the brain in a, in a very holistic manner uh, and, and really looking at the coupling between brain body behavior. Even when you have simple robot bodies, having the physical robot, there's always these aha moments that you would never expect. And I do think to get to a truly cognitive system, uh, we really need to look closely at how the brain uh, does this. Uh, and you know, this is our existence proof. It's really our only working model. Uh, and I do believe that following this will, will lead to a new class of intelligence systems. I mean, it's not easy, um, but it's certainly um, something that we, I, I feel that like can be done. All right, and I will stop there. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and uh, why don't I leave this slide up in case you wanna see um, <clears throat> these, these links and uh, take any questions you have. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, I have unmuted the uh, people. <laughs> uh, you can unmute yourselves if you have any questions or if you feel more on the shy side, you can also write in the chat, but we encourage you to, to turn on the video and audio so we have a bit more of interaction. Yeah, well, let, let me start, uh, Jeff. Th thanks a lot for, for, for your for your presentation, and uh, uh, I, I think I mean, the one of the one of the main messages that uh, that uh, you got out from your present many messages, you know, relating to these design principles, all very very well uh, described and, and and positioned somehow. Uh, but uh, the the uh, the thing that strikes most out of of the of the, of the presentation, to at least to me, is. Uh, is this uh, you know discussion in parallel of you know the brain uh, as a computer and the brain as a gland, uh, you know the kind of uh, of uh, of uh, chemical you know and, and hormones processing that it is part of the pro of, of 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 you know of cognition of, of how the brain is an important and essential maybe even more important than than the kind of computation so. Uh, uh, I wonder, uh, you know, how, uh, what, what do you mean? What do you think about the, the cognitive system? Do you, do you think we need to explicitly model also uh, the, the, the brain as a, as, as a gland in order to achieve some kind of, uh, you know, uh, cognitive abilities? Uh, or, or, or not, you know, because I mean, uh, the, mainly the robotics community is, is more or less looking at, uh, you know, neurons and uh, neural networks and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And a lot less effort is devoted to, uh, you know, this kind of, of processing, which is also an important part. Uh, so yeah. I, I wonder, you know, if you can uh, comment a little bit more about the relevance in general, you know, of these. Yeah, well, <laughs> I was always drilled by my postdoc advisor not to call the brain a computer. I mean, there's obviously some computation going on, but um, you don't have to, um, when you say gland, I guess you don't have to go down to all levels or even have it be made of biological materials. There's certain principles that you can extract from how the brain does processing. And one that I realized was being ignored a number of years ago was, was these modulatory systems. And then uh, I also talked a, a bunch to uh, Lola Canamero, who was looking at hormonal systems. And she, even more than, than I do, abstracts them. But you get really interesting naturalistic behavior by, by using principles of these. So it used to be when I started this, like I said, I'm going to have to put all the complexity I can possibly think of um, to look at how the brain is, is doing this you know, computation. Uh, but now, uh, I, I've realized, you know, there's certain principles you don't have to have down to like you know, the actual channel level, like what's going on in, in a neuron. You can actually extract what's a neuron doing. Uh, but I think critically important is the anatomy. So um, the brain does not have this kind of layered anatomy or the brain doesn't have a, a, a simple recurrent structure. Um, and that I think is very important to the function. The functional neuroanatomy, I still 
feel is very important because that's uh, the, the pathways and the interactions are, are very important. Also, the idea that the brain is a small world network is an important principle. So no two neurons in a brain are, are very many synapses away from each other. Uh, and that's really important. There are certain brain areas that are hubs. That's another important principle that I think uh, that we should take into consideration. And then these hubs are modulated by lower level processes. So that's another important principle. So I think you can extract principles like that and get, uh, get towards brain processing. And you are seeing that now a little bit in the deep learning community. They, they're a big area of deep learning now is neuromodulation. So they're doing selective plasticity with ideas from uh, neuromodulation in the nervous system. Okay, thanks. Thank you. This was, uh... I have a, a follow-up to this if, since I don't see anyone uh, raised hands yet. Uh, so I'm very happy that you mentioned also the work of, uh, of Lola because we have done, um, so I've done some work based on the research by her and Antoine Hill. Uh, so mm. the work on essentially socially inspired neuromodulation. And I wanted to ask you a bit more about that because going through uh, Pfeiffer and Bongard's work, the, the only, and I mean this literally, whenever you look for the word interaction in their work, it's always about agent environment. So they definitely bring up the very strong point of embodiment and how important it is for an agent to be embodied and have the interaction with the environment, mm -hmm. but not so much about the agent-agent interaction. So yeah. my, I, I was curious to, to hear you comment about what do you feel the place of social interaction and social learning have or should have in the design principles? Yeah, I mean, I think social learning, social interaction is really important, especially application-wise. Uh, that's sort of where you're gonna see uh, this new wave of robotics and especially cognitive and neurorobotics can have a big impact. Um, and Lola's work with hormones uh, got me to, and looking at uh, systems like oxytocin, um, which causes pair bonding. And so she kind of took that and, and had this caretaker bond. And, and, uh, and I, it's not the Hill I work, but there's some really nice work where it's a really cute little robot. And, and if it has nice nurturing, the robot becomes friendly. If it's, it's actually treated at a young age poorly, uh, the robot is just always scared and has this anxious. Uh, and it was a really nice demonstration in a simple way, like having these hormone levels. Um, and the oxytocin story is, is really interesting because it's kind of a drug that's maybe an over, overemphasized, but you know, as far as social trust uh, and, um, and that kind of bond, not just uh, um, you know, maternal bonding. But uh, being able to do that between agents, whether it's two robot agents or a human uh, with a robot caretaker or a caretaker with for a robot, I think is very important. Uh, and in having this trade-off, so sometimes you want, you don't want to be like social, you actually wanna get something done on your own. So that's why I kind of bring it up as a trade-off that there's sometimes uh, cases where you, you actually don't wanna be sociable. Uh, but I think having that bonding will uh, facilitate more natural interaction. And especially I think in kind of the, the robot support systems or cognitive assistance, that's gonna be critically important. And, and again, it's one of those things I find really fascinating that low level processes like oxytocin and vasopressin um, can make a huge difference. So I, when I teach this, I, I go through the case of uh, the voles. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this and I'll get it backwards, but there's the metal vole and the prairie vole. And I think the metal vole is uh, polygamous and the prairie vole is monogamous. I might have it backward, but you see differences in the receptor levels of oxytocin and vasopressin. It's two, two related animals, but different species. And you can actually turn the polygamous one into a monogamous one by doing genetic engineering of, <laughs> uh, you know, of, the, uh, of these receptors, which fascinates me. Like you can change its overall behavior of how it, uh, how it bonds with, with uh, both uh, its mate and also its children uh, by, by just changing the level of, this, of these hormones. It's just amazing to me. And that's something we just think of like a very human cognitive um, behavior, <laughs> um, but it is regulated by something very low level. 
not to say that we have no control over these things, but, but it is a very important aspect. Yeah, I, I think it comes on, I mean, on the level of when designing a schema of which, um, which events in the environment are a trigger for you, it's still the, the social aspect. It's something on the same level, same as seeing a light, same as feeling something, uh, encountering an obstacle. Having also interaction with people is something that shapes us, I mean, down to the lowest level of hormones. So Yeah, yeah. yeah it's true. And it, it's what makes us human or what makes animals more natural. And so... I think it's very important to have that in your system. So as you want to have these, these things in interacting with other agents, whether they're humans or, or others, it makes the interaction more natural. Um, do we have a question from the audience before I start uh, like hogging the talk with my follow-up questions? You can also unmute yourselves directly. I think that, yes. It's set for, yeah, sorry, I, I think we're all a little bit tired since it's- Oh, well, it's <laughs> late in the day, I understand, yes, I appreciate uh, that. <laughs> we are a bit more interactive earlier in the day, but um, <laughs> anyways, while, while people gather their thoughts, I, I have a couple of um, other. So one is related more to the work that uh, you did with Tiffany Hu on the neurobiological schema. So something that you showed for the, the study with the HSR robot, is that uh, being exposed to exploring the environments properly and creating a schema for each environment helps a lot then to um, essentially locate even a novel object. What I wanted to ask is how is this integrated on the um, lower level? So whether there is a knowledge base integrated, so the robot already has a list of what these objects are. So associating the name of the object with the image or is it done as a learning on the fly? Oh yeah, good, good specific question. Um... Yeah, sorry. I can't remember if we used uh, Coco or another, or, or YOLO. We, we used one of the uh, object recognition systems and retrained okay. it. So, so we had a deep network. So when, uh, I don't know if you can see faintly, it's doing uh, object recognition of chairs, backpacks, uh, bottle, see the faint wording. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it built on that and uh, we would cue it with an object and then it would have to find uh, have to find an object from its YOLO training, or let's go with YOLO, which is the only look once uh, neural network. So it would have to find an object that matched it. Um, okay. And and the um, the association was that object with a place. All right, so it had place cells, and so uh, if it was retrieving this bottle here, uh, it would learn that it would have a place cell that would be active with this bottle. Uh, and that would be this learned association. So it was a paired association, which is actually how the original experiment went. So there were these wells had a location and it had an odor. So you cue it with an odor and then the rat would learn the schema and know which of these wells had that odor. So it would go there and dig and then there'd be food, a food treat there. Uh, the, the pairing is done only with the location or also uh, forming a cluster of other nearby objects? Well, that's the thing. So the context pattern is a cluster of nearby objects, uh, even objects that aren't in the YOLO database. So, uh, so this becomes a schema. And uh, we had a winner-take-all network. So this is kind of schematized, if you will, here, this medial prefrontal cortex uh, one of these neurons would be most highly active given this contextual pattern. So if, the, if you put a new object in this contextual pattern, uh, it would trigger this same schema and then bring back the memory of that. But if you had a new contextual pattern that um, wasn't familiar and was highly novel, then uh, a new schema neuron would win and you'd start to build up associations for that new, um, in, the, in our case, that would be a, a new room. And in the original rat experiment, that would be a, a completely different layout and different objects in the, in the uh, world. Okay, thanks. Okay, there's David, yes. Hi, Jeff. How are you doing? Hey, David. Um, nice to see you. Um, 
Thanks, thanks for a great talk, really enjoyed it. Um, I, I'd like to put something to you. Um, I, I'm a big fan of um, the extended view of cognitive architectures, including both the endocrine system as well as the, the, um, the cortical system um, um, for, for many different reasons. Um, and in particular, um, the idea that embodiment is crucial, so you need the whole thing together. The problem is um, that a lot of people say that's, that's great in principle, but um, how are you going to get your cognitive robot to make a cup of coffee? Um, and, and the issue seems to be that there's still quite a long way to go before we can bootstrap these compelling arguments into a system which can pursue um, knowledge, uh, rational um, inference about the world around it and pursue purpose of uh, goals in the sense that we would like our cognitive robots to do. I think it'll happen. I'm just concerned that it's gonna take a while. And I wonder if you had some um, thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I agree. It'll happen and will take a while. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, when I started this, I, I was, you know, many years ago, I, I, I refused to take, um, I don't want to call them shortcuts, but abstractions of principles. So we, we tried to be as low level as possible. Uh, and now I realize sort of, um, maybe because it's taking a while, that, that uh, there, there's a nice middle ground. So uh, you can build up certain behavioral repertoires and you can have them. We always did have like um, different behaviors or we called them innate uh, reflexes that, that your system could do. So if you look at Tiffany's work, um, one, was, one was the object recognition. So we harnessed what we, you know, what some of the great classification work that's been done in deep neural nets. And another was the whole picking up objects. Uh, we, we skirted the whole sensory motor issue of doing that and, and had, you know, used something from robotics of how to actually, with your arm, locate where the object is, pick it up and put it down. So, so we did take, you know, shortcuts there. Um, the long-term reasoning is, a, is an open issue. Uh, I, I look at predictive systems and, and there's a lot of work there, but that's, that's still, like you said, it's not gonna quite get you there. We have a long way to go. I don't wanna do the, uh, and I think it came up at TransAir, I don't wanna do a hybrid system where you have, you have to lay on the symbolic system because I, I just don't think it's right, even though it might make things easier. Uh, I think that came up, you were there at the TransAir workshop, it came up a few times where yeah. you have a connectionist low level system and you have a symbolic high level system and they kind of took the Kahneman idea that the you have the fast and the slow, um, where the fast is the connectionist and the slow is the, um, uh, is the symbolic system. And so you have this hybrid system. And um, I'm always a little leery of just putting symbols on there because then you kind of, you kind of have it has homunculus problem that, that you're the one picking the symbols. It'd be really nice for the system to learn the symbols as it needs it. Um, so I don't have a, a ready answer. I mean, it's going to take a while. I, the other thing is, you know, I'm, I'm basically a neuroscientist. So I'm really, my main motivation is trying to understand how the brain works. So, uh, or one of my main motivations, I'm also a practical person. So, so I really want to know how the brain builds up these I mean, obviously we use some sort of uh, categorization and build up symbols, especially with language. So how do we do that um, is something that I'm, I'm very interested in, uh, in the long term. As far as getting a practical system that can do all those things, like you said, it's gonna take a while. Um, certainly, if you wanna be a little more practical, you can take advances from all these different areas and, and kind of make a hybrid system that way. Uh, in some ways you might get a working system, but in some ways you might um, get a system that's a little too brittle. So that's, that's kind of the trade-off. So I guess okay. I ramble along without an answer because I don't have the answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so can I follow up? Um, Anna? Sure, sure. Um, so clearly um, that view of symbolic reasoning is something that, that um, well, I say clearly, uh, one could conjecture that that's an emergent property. 
um, of the type of neuromorphic system that you're talking about and not something that is pasted on on top when you get this engineering orient hybrid, but rather that, that, that symbolic um, approach is something that emerges out of the dynamics um, within your, your system. Um, and I wonder though, if, if, if neuroscience can still um, provide an interesting answer. I reread Tom's 1948 paper recently, and I didn't read what I expected to read there at all. I mean, his concept of a cognitive map is far, far more general than I, mm. and than I expected. And I was only put onto it by reading Barron's work um, on, on working memory. And, and it seems that, that he was suggesting a long time ago that, that there are principles at play whereby you can abstract generalities um, from the sensory motor contingency and then you can layer a hierarchical model that way without injecting anything from outside onto it. Um, and I, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on, 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 on that work specifically in the, the work of Barron's commentary on Tolman's work. Yeah, I've been um, I've been revisiting Tolman. We have a we actually have a project um, on cognitive maps itself, and we are looking at it from a navigation standpoint. But um, it's it goes much beyond that. So it's navigation is kind of a a nice test of the idea because it's really a mental map. Uh, and what strikes me by the Tolman work and what's coming out of the labs that are doing rodent navigation is this um, neural correlate or brain signature of planning. You see it in hippocampal place cells and then also the frontal areas that it's interacting where um, you see kind of planning through different outcomes, but then you also see a different pattern with what Toman called vicarious trial and error. So when you're at an indecision point, <laughs> you see brilliantly now you see in the neurals, uh, in the neural code, you see this, do I go left? Do I go right? Uh, and I think if you extrapolate that from navigation, just how we solve problems, uh, I think you have a general um, general planning compute, you know, planning system, right? That can do multi-step planning. And, and I find that really interesting. And, and uh, there's a few other aspects of Tolman that that demonstrate this and, and have a you know a built hypothesis building was another idea that people don't talk about as much when they talk about Tolman, but that was in his original papers. Um, so it's pretty amazing. Um, it still doesn't get to kind of the symbolic part, but it does get to maybe a reasoning system, right? If you, um, and I suppose you could think of place cells as almost like a symbol, right? Because a place cell <clears throat> has a very strong signal of, of this location. And, the, and when you see these, replays or preplays, you're seeing sequences of potential locations or a potential path. So I suppose if you treat those place cells not as locations, but as ideas. And on the hippocampus is building up very complicated memory. So each neuron or each pattern of neurons is, is a different concept, maybe. You may be able to work through concepts. So that's why I'm fascinated by the Tolman work and why we did the cognitive map thing. I mean, they funded it because they want better uh, navigation systems, but you know, I'm thinking of it as, as a better, um, just general uh, planning system. That's funny you read it Thank too. You. I mean, I, I went back in the last two or three years and read the original 48, 1948 yeah. papers. Like, wow, <laughs> yeah, yeah these were my scientific like heroes. Anyway. Yeah, the other one just, uh, just, uh, and then I, I think there's another question. The other one I went back for a class and read was some of the original papers by uh, Alan Turing. And there is some stuff in there that I didn't realize he was predicting, like the whole reinforcement machine learning field he predicted, the whole, you know, the the, uh, the whole developmental robotics field. I mean, he he basically laid out. I mean, besides the imitation game and a whole bunch of this, there's this one paper I think in 1950 or something that just is amazing. Like all of AI and machine learning kind of comes out of that paper. Yeah, yeah bro. Too, yeah. So th those years, I think. I think people should should go back and read. I mean, you know, yeah, should go back reading some of these articles. You know. and, if you want to, I mean, there's at least in the um, in the case of the cognitive maps, there's a lot of recent papers. Uh, there's been a lot of work because of the uh, 
of the rodent community that are looking at from a navigation, but it's exciting now because there's the techniques they're using, they're, they're finding neural correlates of what Tolman predicted. Um, and that's, uh, so there's been a lot of activity in this, this area in the neuroscience community. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it is important because now we know more. So you go back and, and, and reread the theories, you find uh, something interesting there. Yeah, yeah. That's true. yeah. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, if there are no other questions, I think uh, we can thanks, thank Jeff uh, once more for this interesting, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll stay in touch. We will we'll include yeah. in, the mailing, in the mailing list. Yeah. Usually our you know meeting time is a little bit early for you, but uh, uh, we, we, we can try. <laughs> We can try to make it. That's all right. If it's not too, too early, I'll just uh, watch over breakfast. Okay. okay. Also, <laughs> That's what I did during the trans air <laughs> workshop. Yeah. Okay. Usually we do post the recordings then on the ICOG initiative YouTube. So they're all available together. Okay. With the yeah. And I'm sure but... my students would be very interested too. So, okay. Yes. Yes. They are all yeah. there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank Have you. a nice thank evening. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff, and thanks to all the attendees. Thank you. Thank you.